Well, here I have in my hand some seeds, a packet of seeds, right? And this packet is packed with potential, right? Uh, you could use it as a, as a sort of percussion instrument, uh, which I would like to do. But it, from this small set of seeds, this little set of seeds, there's pictures here on the front, but actually from this little set of seeds, you could have a lot of flowers come out of this. And anyone who's ever done any gardening, and I know I'm speaking with some professionals, I'm the amateur speaking with professionals, but if, if you see these things, you can actually have seeds that turn into trees, all right? I mean, it's not just uh, little things that come out of seeds, but little tiny seeds can turn into a whole bed of flowers or a whole uh, garden full of, of food uh, and, and things like that. And it all starts, again, with a seed. And when you think about it, I, I don't know if you can see it from there, but when here at the top, this is actually called an annual, which I think is really cool because annuals and, and things like perennials and things like that, what it means is basically you'll think it's done and you're like, oh, that season's over. And then what do you know? The next season, in the same spot, you've got even more sometimes than you had the first season. You go, wow, this is amazing. It's a perpetual thing. And so the potential and the perpetual potential of a seed is something that someone could think about for a long, long time. And Again, when you think about this, for all their potential power, when I think about this packet of seeds, it could sit inside our house, which it kind of has done for a little while, but it could sit inside this packet, it could sit right in here, and you'll never see a flower come out of it. I mean, this is it, it's, that's it. It's just potential, but nothing more than that. And it can lead to something useful, it can lead to something beautiful, but truly, I don't know that if I gave, you know, lend this and said, I got you some flowers. You know, she'd kind of be excited, but she'd go like, well, I don't know about that. You know, it's a picture of them. It's a packet of that. And she actually would enjoy the process of seeing them grow. But you get what I'm saying. It's sort of like, wait a minute. There's more to it than just the seed. And if you never plant the seed, it will never reach its potential. It can sit on a shelf. And if you Think about this, the, the lack of growth there, it's not because of a problem with the seed, right? Mm -hmm. It's not. And that's what we're going to talk about some today. If there's no April showers, there's no May flowers. Mm -hmm. But even if there are April showers, but this is sitting right inside, still not going to do anything. And so that's the interesting thing for me anyway about a seed, which is that it's packed with potential. And it will either be met exceeded with my expectations, or you'll say, like, why didn't that ever grow? And so when you think about it, it's, it's got instructions in it known as DNA. We know that now. But that it contains almost, almost everything necessary for life, for growth, but not everything, right? There's some things external to it that have to be also in effect. And so when I think about that, the seed needs the soil, the soil needs the seed, right? You can have dirt with no seed, and it won't grow anything. You can have seed with no dirt, and it won't grow anything. It's the combination of these things. And to say it simply, again, we need seed, and that's where the miracle of growth begins. And so I titled today, Soils and Souls, and I'll probably trip over those <laughs> words at some point, but... You get the point, right? Soils and souls. And soil without seed will never produce, right? And if you have good soil in a well-watered and sun-soaked location in the right way, man, it is just short, in my mind, of miraculous. Even when you understand the science. And especially if you understand the science. See, that's the thing for me. It's never, never an either or. The more I know about this process, the more mysterious it is. You go like, yeah, I get it, sort of. Um, you know, I, I know it's this, you know, thing that the sun does and the water does and the ground does and the, and the sea does. And you go, yeah, but try to recreate that. Right. And you go, oops, uh, I'm not so good at doing that. Right. See, likewise, seed without soil will never produce a seed by its seed itself will sit on the shelf. Right. For years without a sprout, without so much as a little green thing. And you think about that and you go, wow, it is weird. And so waiting for soil to start the growth process without a seed is like looking at it and going, well, you know, and it's like, I'm dirt. I'm just dirt, you know. So even the best soil, the best soil in the world, if it doesn't have something to give growth, it won't come from it. So the seed needs the soil. The soil needs the seed. And at this point, you may be wondering, who is that at the door? Um, if there is someone at the door, you can go. I think I heard it. Did it knock, or am I imagining things? If I'm hearing voices, um, it's possible. Oh, wow. Um, 
Len, remind me, get the meds. Um, sorry, no, I'm not on them, but maybe I should be, but I'm hearing things that aren't there. Okay, at this point, some of you may be wondering a lot of things, but one of the things you're wondering is, is this a Bible study or a gardening class, right? And this is the thing, it's a Bible study about gardening, because the first part of Mark chapter 4 is all about soil and seed and weed and feed and miracle grow. It's, it's speaking spiritually, but it's using a f physical analogy. And I love the way Jesus did that. I love the way God as our creator uses the creation to teach us stuff. If you'll listen to your life, if you'll go through life paying attention, all of us can learn things from everyday experiences, which is exactly what a parable is. And again, when you think of soils and souls, right, and that miracle grow package. I like to think about it this way. I like to play with words, but you think about the combination of sun and soil, right? That's a really volatile, great, life-giving thing, right? You have dirt that's all dirty, and you have the seed in there, and then you have the sun shine on it. And it's, it, it, there are times when I look and mow the lawn, and I'm thinking, where was this yesterday? I mean, it's just... <laughs> Miracle. If, it, if you could watch it, it's almost like a time lapse in some places. But I think about this one too, sun and soul. Mm. The son of God and a soul, man, what a combo. Yeah. What can happen when those two come into contact? What can happen in a person's life? Again, the physical growth was sun and soil. Oh, the spiritual growth was sun, S-O-N, and soul. And so I think about these, they lead to potential growth, potential growth. And I keep giving you that word because got to remember, it can be missed. It can ha not happen. In spite of all of it, you can say, oh, it just seemed like we had everything in place. Why didn't it go? Why didn't it grow? Why not the miracle when you're looking at the soul of a person? Well, Jesus gives us some insight into it. And he makes the point with parables. And again, when you think about this, this is the well-known, maybe, parable of the soil and the souls. The four soils representing four souls. And God in this picture is the gardener, okay? That's important to know. So if you're taking notes or you're thinking it through, just burn that into your brain. God is the gardener. So he's got a green thumb, right? I mean, he's good. He is good, right? He's done this before. His word is the seed, okay? It, you can have the best soil in the world, and if you have no seed in that, nothing's going to happen. It doesn't matter how fertile it is. And so what you have is you have this thing that has the germ of life in it. And it can sit there, and it can sit there on a shelf, and nothing happens, right? But you put it into a soul, and something can happen. So the first thought that I wrote down, and I hope you'll think it through, is the seed is good. Okay, let's, in the picture, and in our minds, we got to realize there is nothing wrong with the Word of God, all right? Doesn't, oh, the problem here is the Word of God just wasn't powerful enough to get the job done. And you go, no, the seed is good. In this parable, and in practical reality there's nothing lacking in God's word for a soul to be changed for a soul to have a miracle occur okay nothing missing from that so the the seed's supernatural the seed is the word of God that's in the parable and it's very important for us to have it in our mind that the truth the scriptures the bible it's perfect it's power packed with potential but again it needs a little something else not that it's lacking but simply the combination needs to occur. So when you think about that, like a physical seed, the seed of God's word contains everything necessary in and of itself that when that combination hits, it's gonna work. Now, again, the sower is good. And I actually played with that word just a tiny bit by making one of the O's a little less prominent. I don't know if you can see it in there, but the sower is good, but the sower is even better than good. The sower is God. So again, the sower is God. I mean, come on, this is not... Scott's a good preacher or not a good preacher. Or, oh, you got to come see my pastor. He's so great. I'm talking about the sower in this parable is God. Okay. What that means is sometimes he uses people, of course, but God is very good, right? He doesn't need me. He's not like going, oh no, Scott didn't share the word with somebody. <gasps> what am I going to do? The gardener is God. He can figure it out. All right. There's nobody on this planet who doesn't get the opportunity for the gardener to do something in their life. I really believe that. You see so many stories of that in the Bible. If there was someone who was hungry, let me assure you, God can seek them out. Now, again, you might get the opportunity to be one of the persons raking the ground or breaking the ground or dealing with that or pouring out water or doing whatever. Okay, great. 
But remember, the gardener is God. You're not the gardener, and that's good, because if it was up to you, <laughs> there wouldn't be nearly the crop and harvest that there has been and will be. So God's a great gardener. You know, if, if I don't grow spiritually, it's not your fault. And if you don't grow spiritually, guess what? It's not my fault. <laughs> I love it. It's not my fault. The gardener is good. Scott may be terrible, but guess what? The gardener's good. And the gardener's God. So that takes a lot of pressure off me. It gives it all the pleasure of it, of saying, well, hey, man, I, I, I may even get to play a little bit of the part and go, oh, look at the miracle. Did you do that? No, but I was there when it happened. If the gardener's great, the seed is supernatural. The only question mark in my mind surrounds the soil, and that's where Jesus put it. That's where in this variable of this parable, he put a blank. He put a, a question mark. What is it? What soil will you be? What soul will you be? Again, if this was a constant and you were stuck with the soil you are and this is my soul and it's the way it is, what's the point of the parable? I know people who are like that, who are like, well, the world's divided into four kinds of people and this is what they are and here's the three quarters that don't make it and here's the quarter that does or something. I'm like, well, you missed completely Jesus's point. What was Jesus's point? You get to choose the soil that you want to be, right? I mean, you can decide how you react to the seed and the sower. And that's the great thing about it. Again, it throws a little bit of the process back into our court. And so I think about this. There's four types of soil, four souls. If you write them down or think them through, this is it. Hard soil, the hard soul, right? Hard soil, hard soul. The thin soul or the thin soil, the crowded soul, and the miracle grow soul. That's what I'm calling it, the miracle grow soul. That you just go, how did that happen? How did this person who I knew like this become that? How did this little thing become that enormous soul? You know when you meet someone who's just enormous of soul that you go like, were they always like this? Is this just the way they are? And you go, no, it's something that happens when the combo is right. And so I think about this soul searching. That's what this is going to be. A soil searching time for each one of us, right? To say, Lord, how's my soul today? Mm -hmm. We can choose. What kind of soil are you? What kind of soil am I? What kind of soul am I? And what one do I want to be? Mm -hmm. And what kind of response do I have when I hear the word of God? So let's get into it. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. I'll read it with you. Um, this is what it says. And again, Jesus began to teach by the sea. And a great multitude was gathered to him and so he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea and the whole multitude was in the land on the land facing the sea and he taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching now i stopped there real quickly this was a natural amphitheater right if you've ever been like someone out in a boat on a lake it's kind of weird but they can talk on that boat and you can hear them from the shore right it, it's it's a strange thing with with auditory but this is what you see is he's got a multitude laid out there and he's out in a boat and he's talking across the water and he doesn't have a microphone but everyone can hear him at least they could if they wanted to right he was plenty audible and so this is what he says i love the way he says it there there's a, a great and well-known um, southern preacher who I, I've enjoyed over the years who always says now listen now listen now you know in the middle of a sentence and and gotcha, and now listen and and I love the way he does it because I'm like if I wasn't listening in the car or whatever I was listening but this is what Jesus does he says now listen verse three behold a, behold a sower went out to sow and it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it and verse 5, some fell on stony ground where it didn't have much earth and immediately sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up and it was scorched because it had no root and it withered away. Then verse 7, some seed fell among the thorns. The thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced. Some 30 fold, some 60, some 100. And he said to them, if you got ears to hear that, let, I, I think you should hear that. You know, and, and some people in that crowd, you know how it is in a mixed crowd. There's some people who said, what? Um, you know, did he just say something? What did he say? And Jesus is talking again in this large open area. And he had even said the crowd was going to crush him if he didn't go out in the boat, right? They're pressing in for something. But you know what they were pressing in for? You know what it was if you paid attention to the gospel accounts. They wanted their miracle. 
right? What miracle did they want? They wanted a physical healing. Now, can't blame them. I'm the same way. You're the same way. It's so easy to focus on the physical. I'm like, I need a miracle. And, you know, they were all pushing and shoving for that. But Jesus says, you need a message more than you need a miracle, right? Now, he would do miracles, but the miracles were parables, as I've told you before. Almost all of them pair really well with the message he was giving. So he would heal a blind man and then talk about the importance of spiritual sight and insight. So almost all of them tie very closely together. It doesn't mean that he doesn't care about the physical, but it's not his primary, and it's not the reason he came. So people would press in on this, and he'd say, well, now's a great time for a message. And some people are going to miss it because they're like, well, why is he preaching? I just need my healing so I can go home. We've all seen that attitude in our own life sometimes, too. But I think about it, four soils, four soils right here, right? Hard souls, thin souls, crowded souls, miracle souls. And when you think about that mixed motive, I've had mixed motives, so have you. I mean, let's, let's be transparent. There are times in my life where I'm very hard-hearted. There I'm very hard of hearing, spiritually speaking, right? There are times when I'm pretty shallow on things, and I'm kind of like, God, I, I don't really want to learn the deep lessons of this suffering. I just want it to stop, right? I mean, let's, I don't really care. Uh, I'm sure there's a deep lesson I'm supposed to learn, but so what? You know, and, and then there's other times where I'm like, yeah, 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 I'm going to get to that. I'm just really busy right now, right? I'm at the school, the business manager, and I often tell people I'm the busyness manager because I'm like, man, it's so much busyness. And I know there's important things to get to, but sometimes the tyranny of the urgent screams louder. And so when you think about this, they get a lesson on gardening. I don't know what they came for, but that's what they get. They get a very compact message, right? He just kind of gets out in the boat and says, if you heard anything, just hear this. There was a gardener, a sower, seed, soil, and see you guys. And they go off in the boat. And everyone's left on the shore going, what? <laughs> and I can picture question marks over their head, right? You know, if they were cartoon characters, boop, you know. <laughs> what is he talking about? The, the person next to me, did he say seed? Did he say soil or soul? I thought this guy was spiritual. Why is he talking about this? You know, it's thorns and crops and what? what is in the world? Let's just go to lunch. And so you've seen this, you know, it was easy to walk away from this moment with no understanding. But what would also be easy to do is carry this thought with you. Later, if he had just given him a passage to mem memorize, you go, now what's that passage again? But when Jesus told stories, people go, I don't have any idea what he's talking about, but he talked about four different things and soils, and I, I, I don't know, what do you think it means? I don't know, what do you think it means? So maybe at lunch, they talked about it and said, I have no idea what it means. But Jesus started the story with the two words, listen and behold, because he was inviting them with this bookend at the end to say, if you've got ears to hear that, think on it, wrestle with it. And it's amazing what the word listen does to us, which is get us hopefully to, to lean in and pay a little attention. And, and when he's saying this is that the casual learner, the casual, casual listener will not understand the message they'll miss it entirely jesus got their attention told the multitude a story and this is the the thing i hope you'll get is that people who came for a miraculous wonder they probably did wonder where's my miracle and jesus just gave them one he just gave them a seed supernaturally in a few verses that would have changed their life forever and not just their life but the forever after their life right and so you think about that you go hmm Wow, he, he handed them this, and then, what is this? I don't know what this is. I don't know, read the directions. I don't read the directions. Who cares? You know, it, I, I wanted a bouquet of flowers, right? Or hand me a carrot or something. And he's like, I just did. I handed you something that if you would have done what I asked you to do with it, you would have everything you needed with it. For verse 10, Jesus, when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parable. And he said to, you, to them, this is so important, to you it's been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins would be forgiven them. Now, if you look at that text just by itself, and those were the only verses you knew anywhere in the Bible, you might say, man, Jesus is like a mystery man. He only came to touch 12 lives, and he doesn't care about anyone else. He's trying to confuse people. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to 
have these puzzling little enigmas that you go like, I don't know what it means. Well, you have to be super smart to understand it. You have to be an insider. But that's not at all what he was saying. Remember, these guys, these 12, were the same dorks as everyone else. The only difference is when Jesus said, follow me, they did. So now they're going to lunch with him, right? So now they get the follow-up session where they say, hey, Jesus, what was that whole thing out there in the boat? And I think about this again. You and I have this opportunity anytime we want it, right? Because he opens this up, and, and I find it very encouraging that the 12 apostles did not understand this story, right? You go, oh, I don't get the Bible. Well, good, neither did they. The people in it didn't get it, right? That's good. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and the rest were saying, what's, what's with the soil talk, right? I mean, what, what, what was that whole thing, you know? That was weird. And Jesus says, you guys are going to reach your potential because you followed up, because you followed up, because you drew in close and said, I still don't get it. See, it took some humility for them at lunch not to go, yeah, ah, that crowd, they're pretty dumb. Yeah, we know what it means. I'm not going to tell you, but I know what it means. Yeah, I know the poor swath. You know, because we all have that as teachers where you go, anyone have any questions? No, no, everyone understands it. <laughs> then you get the test back and you go, whoa, nobody understood it, right? But everyone understood it, but nobody understood it. And so this is what he's saying. You're asking for insight and I'm giving it to you. And I love that because... Again, there are those who think that Jesus was intentionally confusing the crowd so that they would not be forgiven. But you've got to read the Bible and understand that Jesus came so that people could be forgiven. This is a quote from the Old Testament prophet of Isaiah, and he was actually lamenting it. Uh, Isaiah was saying, you know what, here's the thing. Hardness of heart makes it so that people hear, but they don't hear. They're here, H-E-R-E, -E, they're here, but they don't hear. They sit through some, a message week after week after week, and you're like, what'd you get out of that? I don't know. Um, it, it, preacher not good this week. The worship team wasn't wonderful this week. And you go, wait a minute. Jesus, when you think about it contextually, he, they would see with their eyes. They'd have open eyes, but not open minds. And you think about this again, missing the opportunity to be forgiven and free. That's what he was lamenting. And that's what he's saying, man, I give you parables because, again, a parable is your best chance to understand it later. If you don't understand it today, see, all I have to do is say prodigal son. You know that story? Yep. What if I just said uh, Romans eleven twenty? 20? Anyone uh, know that verse? No. Okay, see, verses are harder but I give you a passage, a story, and you go, what about the Good Samaritan? Anyone remember that? Yeah, I don't get it, but I understand it. Stories are amazing because you carry them with you. Years later, you may remember that. And so Jesus is giving them something saying, well, your, your soil is a little not ready today, but it might be ready later, and you might remember what he said. I wonder what he meant by those four soils. Well, it's here in my notebook. I wonder what it means. And I think about this all the time. I encourage my high school students to take notes, knowing full well, most of them might not fully understand why I'm telling them this right now. And someday later, they'll be going through a footlocker and break it out, and I'll be long with Jesus at this point. And they'll look at it and go, Mr. C, I remember that dusty old guy. Oh, wow. Aww. I wonder what that was. <gasps> wow. Man, I didn't get that at the time in ninth grade. No, you didn't. But that doesn't mean you can't get it. And so parables are meant to reveal truth, not conceal it. But you think about it, it's because of where their hearts were at the time. And so you think about that, it's a really important thought. Seeds, just because it didn't happen this season, doesn't mean it can't happen next season. I think about it all the time. I think to myself, well, ninth grade wasn't it, but maybe 10th grade is. 10th grade wasn't it, maybe 11th grade. 12th grade, nope, that wasn't it. Hey, you know what? I've had kids come back to the school after they graduated and say, I now get what you said that day. And I'm like, ha, there you go. That story you told, I never forgot that. And I was trying to figure out what the point was. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So Jesus said to him, don't you understand this parable? I will tell you, if you don't understand this one, you're not getting any of them. He says, it's kind of like this one's a key to unlock them all. So I love it because it's a mild rebuke of the 12 disciples. He's kind of got, taking out his aerator shoes. Like, has anyone seen those? those these are uh, an invention I think is really cool. It's spike shoes that you walk through your lawn on to get the ground ground up, you know? And they're like glorified baseball cleats except even more so and so 
You see that he says to his disciples, don't be like a dirt clot, guys. I mean, come on. I'm giving you some tips here. And so he explains it to them. And I love that because he explains it to them, which means that he explains it to us, right? Is it, is it working? Every, Carissa's trying to give somebody a signal. Yes, I want a pencil. Oh, can, can you give her a pencil? She wants to take notes. Thank you. So, yeah. No, that's awesome. Thank you. Never be shy to say, I need a pencil. I, I was that kid in class. It was like, I, I have borrowed more paper and pencils for people that I probably owe a lot of people paper. I should go back to all my classmates in high school and hand them a ream and say, there you go. And here's a pack of pencils for all those ones I borrowed. But um, when you think about this, verse 14, I love it. He's going to give you the key, right? You know, when you have a map and it gives you the key. So you don't have to take my word for it. You can take God's word. The sower sows the word. Okay, so he's, he says the seed is the word. Seed equals word. So if you think about this, if you, if you again think about that powerful packed potential, right? The, the word of God is the seed and there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> Souls can be hard, as you've seen, but the seed is good, right? The seed is good. The seed is good. And again, he's giving you these understandings. The seed of the word of God will bear the fruit of God's spirit. What is the fruit of God's spirit? Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Try to grow those things on your own, you will fail. Okay, self-control, I will not have another donut. And then I go have another donut, right? Um, I will have three more donuts, right? I didn't have one, I had three. Um, and, and you go, well, that's not self-control, right? But on, on so many things, you know, I'm going to be kind. I'm just going to be kind. I'm going to be kind all day. And then you realize, I don't have within me kindness all day, right? I got it maybe till nine o'clock. Um, and then after that, that, I'm out, you know, and, and the seed, but the seed is good. And so no, no matter how good or bad the soil is, you got to start with the seed, right? So we think about that. Verse 15, the one that the wayside where the word is sown, they hear and Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their heart. So the first soil, verse 15, you can write it down or think it through. Souls can be hard. Ever met a hard-souled person where you're just like, Man, how are you? Especially sad in my book is when it's a young person. And I, I fully understand how life can harden a soul early. I mean, I get it. I get the fact that there's some people by the age of eight who've seen and experienced things that they should never experience in a lifetime. And I understand how that can pack a person down. I get it. I get it completely. But when you look at that, this is what he's saying. He's saying it, it, a soul can be hard at any point in life. And what happens is he calls it the wayside. Now, um, Jackie knows this, and some other people from Miami know it. There's a church there called Wayside Baptist, which I always thought was the funniest <laughs> name for it, because I'm like, wait a minute, in the wayside, the wayside's the one that the seed bounces off of. It's not on a street called Wayside that I know of, right? So I don't know where they came up with that name, but I'm like, I'd change it. But uh, wonderful people. I am not against Wayside Baptist. Love them, love them, love them. But I'm just letting you know it's a weird name. Um, it's kind of like, you know, Cement Heart um, Baptist, you know, or something. You're like, I don't know. It doesn't sound good, right? So yeah, and it's like, okay, in the farmer's field, this is in those days, and to these days, um, farmers got some in the room. Uh, you walk a path when you're sowing seed, right? You walk through. You have to walk through the actual garden, and you, if you're smart, what you do is you take the same path each time, so you're not just randomly walking through the garden. But it packed it down. It packed it down. And so some of the seed would fall on the path that people walk through, through the garden, right? And this is what he's saying. It just sit there on the surface, and it's not going to go in. It's good seed, right? Good seed on bad soil. That's, that's the bottom line. It's the same soil as anything else in those days, but it'd be packed down. And the birds like seed too, right? That's how simple it is. They go, hmm, they like it like this. If this was a vegetable seed or something, I don't eat the seeds, really. I don't, I don't, you know. But birds, they look at it and they don't wait for it to become a carrot. They're happy to eat the carrot seed, right? Or the squash seed or whatever else. So this is what you see. The seed is the word of God. And the soil, the soul, if it's hard, if it's packed down, if it's not receptive, it's going to get stolen. Satan stole the seed from the, from the soul. And you think about that. You can't have my soul. 
but he can take the seed out of my soul, can he? He can bounce it off my brain. Boing, you know, God's word comes and I think I could solve it two ways, my way or God's way. And it's like boing and, and God's way just bounces off me. And I think I got this thing, right? And it's because Jesus is saying that souls that are hard hear the word of God, but they're hard of hearing, right? Hard of heart. It just sits there on the surface. There it is. And it's not just going to sit there forever. This is the whole point. It's, there's an active agent also. There's a sower that's good, but there's a bird that's bad, right? You get that in the picture. And so Bible studies that sound like blah, 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 Mark 4, blah, 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 blah. Um, that will actually get stolen. It can get stolen. There's a time to act on almost any truth that comes my way, right? And so when you think about it, is the problem the seed? No. Is the problem with the sower? No. Now, you could say, well, the sower should have been more careful on where they did it and prepped the ground and all that stuff. But I actually see the generosity of the sower that he doesn't say, not worth the seed. Mm -hmm. The truth is, I look at God saying every soil is worth the seed. Yeah. And you may look, might look at a person and say, too hard-hearted, not even worth it. Mm -hmm. Who am I to look at someone's soul and know what it is? I don't know. Some of the people I thought weren't listening at all all in my life would later come on and say that was the most influential day of my life i'm like really i thought you were asleep you're like no i guess i you know dreamed it or whatever but god is so generous he's so seed even on what we would consider bad soil and i think about this life has a way of breaking up the ground doesn't it, it has a way of breaking up my ground and i think about this the miracle mist is such a sad moment but you know what, God, again, he's got plenty of seed. He's not running out. He's not, like, miserly with it. And I love that about God when I see it. it. teaches me some things. Verse 16, the next soil. Look at this one. Thin, shallow, stony ground. So I wrote this. Souls can be thin, right? When you think about that, a thin soul, what does this mean? Well, if you picture your driveway, if it's concrete, and you were to go spread some potting soil over the top of that. If someone didn't know that it was a cement driveway underneath it, they would go look at that and go, wow, that's some very nice soil. What a great garden that would be. But the truth is, right underneath, half an inch of potting soil is complete concrete. And this is what Jesus was describing. He says, these likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. <gasps> you know, so this is different than the first soil. There's a reception. And a good and glad reception. But it says they have no root in themselves, so they endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now, when I think about this again, souls can be hard, but souls can be thin. right? What this means is that there is a thin layer of receptivity to something. This is not the person, I don't want to hear that, I'm hostile toward it. They actually, man, I, that's exciting. I, wow, that's so good. And Len and I, over the years, have seen it's almost a truism that gets sad to us in a way, that the more excited somebody is about something, the less likely you are to ever see them again. I can't tell you how many people have come to me and said, this is the greatest thing ever. I will be here every day. This is amazing. And Len and I will go, sadly, we will never see that person again. And it's true. <laughs> we'll never see them again. And you go, how could that be? How could somebody who was so enthusiastic... Well, this is what Jesus was saying. A soul can be thin, a thin layer of good soil, but not enough to really let a root grow because roots are where fruits really come from. Roots are the unseen source of moisture when it isn't raining right now. See, and the thing is, if, if you have a shallow root system, this is what's ironic about it. It'll grow quickly because it doesn't waste time growing a root right? Don't have to have any effort toward roots. It's just all up, you know. But the problem is the sun comes out and the same sun that would have given great growth to this thing if the root was there withers it. It's counterproductive. It's actually no tolerance for sun. See, and I think about this miracle grow. If there's no root, it's miracle go just as quick. It's like, where did that miracle go? It, they were so excited. They were so enthusiastic. They were so, they, they bought the big Bible. They got the big case to go with it. What happened? Well, this is what happened. No energy on the root. No energy on the root. Because that's the invisible part. That's the part underground. That's the part that nobody sees. 
And you think about this, everything's outward, but if it is, if that's all it is, well then, <sighs> there is no such thing as an overnight wonder, right? Whenever people talk about that, oh, overnight success, I don't think there is such a thing. There are people who have success because they worked overnight on something, <laughs> night after night, night after night, night after night. People see it as a quick spring up, but that's never true. If it lasts, there was something that went into the root. So the soil here was shallow, thin, no room for the root. And a thin soil here with thin souls, right? It's an emotional layer over a motionless soul. What does that mean? Man, I'm enthusiastic about that point. I wrote it in my notes and I did absolutely nothing about it this week. Zero. I didn't put it into practice. I thought it was cool. I thought it was funny. I laughed at the joke. I thought this was great, but I did nothing different this week. And you go, okay, that's the part that is, you know, as soon as trouble comes, everything goes. Spring up quickly, fizzle out fast. And so I think about this. It looks good until the first obstacle, the first hurdle, the first time it's difficult to obey the word. Because, you know, let's face it, sometimes it is hard to obey God's word. The person gives up. And you think about this. Notice in verse 17 that the persecution and trouble came for the word's sake. Right? It doesn't just say generalized trouble. It's like specific trouble. There's times where, again, if a person really grows... There's going to be some time where your root will be challenged because somebody's going to come in and want to yank that root. And if it's there, it's hard to get out. But if it's shallow, whew. again, if I can convince you into the Christian faith, somebody can convince you out. That's why I don't spend much time with that. I'm kind of like, if you want to grow, I can show you how. But if you aren't convinced and you need another argument for why you're in, someone else is going to come up with another argument for why you're out. The Spirit of God puts roots down where I'm like, man, I don't have all the answers. There's a huge file in my life of I have no idea. But you know what? When the Holy Spirit's working on a person's life, I think they can take root in spite of doubt. I don't know. But wilted in the sun. Isn't this interesting? The sun didn't cause the problem. The sun's the solution. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, again, the same sun that wilts a plant is the very thing that gives life to it. You put it in the dark, only mushrooms grow there, right? The sun is a necessary part of growth, and persecution and difficulty is a necessary part of growth. But it'll also be the distinguisher between somebody who roots or not. And so when I look at it, it's another opportunity. When you prune a plant, the root structure grows stronger. And sometimes you look at something and you go, man, you're killing that thing. I knew a guy who was an expert gardener, and I was always like, he's brutal to plants, man. That guy's mean to plants. No, I'm mean to plants. I let them grow wild and they die. This guy prune them, prune them, prune them, and you go, wow. It's like a stick in the dirt. And then, and you go, wow. So when you think about that, sometimes guys, people think God is mean as a pruner, right? Yeah. Just growing roots so this doesn't happen to me. The third soil is so important, it can be crowded. Man, this one is really important in our modern day. When you think about this, verse 18, it was important in their day, but you got to believe we get a little more crowded than they did even. There's, here's the one sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. The cares of this world, you might want to star this somehow, verse 19. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things enter in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Now, uh, this to me is, this is where this message hits my soul the hardest, right? I, I try not to have a hard soil, a hard soul. I try not to have a thin, shallow view of spirituality, you know, where when things go my way, I love God. When things don't, I don't. But these three are big. The cares of the world, right? The deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things. Notice, desires for other things, these aren't bad things necessarily. They're just other things. And they choke. <clears throat> choke out the word. Choke out the word. <laughs> the world can choke out the word. So Jesus lays out three things. Again, I think about it. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things. And it crowds out what had been fruitful. See, I love the verb in here because it says they become unfruitful, which means they used to be more fruitful than they are now, 
right? There was a time in their life where there was more focus, more simplicity, more this is what this garden is about. It is producing fruit, but not anymore. Man, now it's producing who knows what. Um, it, it's got a lot of things competing for it. And I think about that. It's so easy to do it. That's why Jesus said it. And it wasn't for condemnation. It was for instruction. And I think about it this way. Illustrations abound. You know, just this morning as I was getting ready, I heard this like really weird sound from the from the washer and dryer room you know the, the where the clothes place and i don't know what you call it what do you call it laundry room yeah sorry i'm like the washer and dryer place okay laundry room yes thank you i know my way around it right i do stuff in there but um uh, this is a total side note, but uh, Lynn should keep me out of that place because I, I don't mix, I mix all colors and everything comes out gray. So then you don't have to worry about colors. That's my theory. You just throw everything in together and pretty soon everything's the same color. So, um, but anyway, there was a, a bird sound coming out of there. I mean, I thought an alarm was going off or something inside the house. It's like, beep, 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 beep. I go in there and, and the hose, you know, the silver hose out the back, the vent out the back of the dryer is moving. I'm like, we're in a haunted house. I'm out. Um, but, but there was a bird building a nest inside this thing. Now, I think about this place. It's called the bird's nest. I love this place. I've actually seen birds in here and stuff. There's plenty of great places for a bird, right? But there's a grate, supposed to be a grate on our vent to keep the bird from building a nest in there. Am I doing that to ruin the bird's life? No, I'm doing that to preserve the bird's life. So the deceitfulness to that bird is... This looks like a good place to build your life, right? And I'm not against that bird. I'm for it. I'm trying to figure out now. We're to, you know, trying to figure out how to get this bird out of there so I can get the grate back on there and keep him out. This is what Jesus is saying. When, when God gives a command and says, this is a place to build your bird nest, and this is not a place. This is not a great place. That's why I put a grate over it. So I said, don't go in there. It wasn't to ruin the life of the bird. It was to preserve the life of the bird. But the deceitfulness of things is this will bring you happiness. This will fulfill you. This will give your life meaning. More money will give you more meaning. More, you know, whatever will add to your life. And sometimes, again, when you think about that, you realize, man, my life's getting choked out, choked out. Why is it getting choked out? I don't know. It's not bad stuff. It's just busy stuff. Have you ever noticed, again, that you don't have to plant weeds or care for them? I can't remember a time when I've seen, like, you know, at the, at the store, you're going through all the different ones, and it's like, you know, destructive milkweed or something. You're like, what? Who would plant that? Who did plant that? Where? How did that get there? I don't know. It's just there. And so when you think about it, souls can be very crowded, and you don't remember planting things. I I, I got so much good mentorship in my life, and I try to continue to put these things into practice. But somebody said, if you have a to-do list, you'd better have a to-not-to-do list, um, because people will keep adding to your to-do list, and you're going, what am I to not do? Um, because it sounds like mater, to not to, you know, but, but I, that's what I do. I, I got to do that, because otherwise, like my closet, if all I keep doing is getting gifts of new shirts, and I never get rid of old shirts, pretty sure all my shirts look old, right? Because they're all wrinkled and crammed in there because I'm never taking anything out of my life. And you think about this, there are a lot of things competing for our soul, right? What would it do to gain, how would a man gain to gain the whole world and lose his soul? And Jesus says, don't lose your soil by giving it away to all the weeds, and it's a profound little thought for me. The same soil that grows flowers grows weeds extra well. See, so think about that. If it's in a barren spot, weeds don't like that nearly as much as they like your garden. You notice that? Plant a garden, you'll get some weeds. You don't know who planted them, but you know they're there. And they love thorns and thistles, love good soil. Put some good soil fertilizer in there, and the thorns and thistles, hey, we got a crop. Oh, wait, this is the wrong stuff. Where's the good stuff? And I think about this, the more potential you or I have for good growth, the more potential we have for bad growth, mm. right? And I think about that all the time when I look into young lives especially. I'm like, this kid will be a leader, a great leader. The question is, which direction will they lead? I do not know. The, the picture on the packet is inconclusive at this point. It says, leader, <laughs> and you go, 
Yeah, there have been some good ones in history. There have been some bad ones. And the same things that lead to great growth can lead to terrible thoughts. And I can, I can think of more wipeouts than I care to count, you know. Lynn will remember this one. There was a family we knew years ago, and dear, dear friends. I mean, I saw so much happening in their lives in such a short time. Their marriage was doing great. Their kids were doing great. And they started coming to, uh, a, a, you know, a worship environment, and so many things were going great. Very gifted. Immediately serving in so many areas. And I can't even list the talents this person had. Both of them. Amazing. You know, this married couple. And they moved into a, a house that was kind of close to the church. They actually moved closer to the church to be more involved in the church when they moved, right? They were like, yeah, we, this, is, this is what we want to be about, right? And they started fixing that house up. They got a fixer upper, right? And so they started fixing her up. Nothing wrong with that. A very talented guy with this. But I, it got to where I would drive by on the way to church, and they'd be working in the yard. And I'd be like, Hey, you know, I'd roll down the window and, yeah, man, hey, looking good. Wow, I love what you did with the plants and stuff. This is amazing. And, you know, again, I, if anyone who knows me, no, I, I, I'm an encourager by nature. I mean, I'm just like, I, I was loving the paint job. They did everything. I, I'm not the guy, why aren't you in church? You know, and stuff like that. I'm not, I'm not into that. I, don't, I like to travel, but I hate guilt trips, right? I don't go on them. I don't give them to people. So, but, you know, I, I'd be like, hey, man, I get, you know, there's, a, there's another study tonight. You can pick it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to be there for that. Can't wait, you know, and stuff. And, oh, it was just, we were so exhausted after that. Couldn't do it. And again, it's not about going to church. I, I know that. It's not. But it's about leaning into the things of God, right? And so I'd drive by, and they were fixing and, fixing and painting, fixing and painting. And pretty soon they were fighting, and, and you know, kids starting to get into difficult things. You know, we're painting. Just go find something to do and all that kind of stuff. And the house was looking better and better, and their life was looking worse and worse. And I watched the slide of it, and there were a couple times where I tried to intervene on it, you know. And, and after a few months... Went by and by and by, you know what? Their marriage actually completely wiped out. Completely wiped out. And they ended up selling that house mm -hmm. that they had worked so hard to make it so much better. And I was thinking to myself, how many times I got to watch this, Lord? Mm -hmm. Again, nothing wrong with home improvements, but there's something even more important with heart improvements, right? Soul improvement. If they had worked as hard on their soul during that time, they could have had that. We, we all love to come over to their house and, and help with stuff. I mean, we were all into that. But they worked on it to the exclusion of it, and pretty soon, choke, choke, choke. And you know, when you think about the crowded thing, it's not to look at them and say, I'm so much better than that. It's for me to look at that and say, I'm exactly like that. I'm so much worse than that. If I, if I, the only problem is if I don't learn anything from them, and I drive by that and I think, well, I didn't learn anything from that. Becoming unfruitful means that, man, sections of my life could be incredible. And then later you'd go, well, how did this become that? The same way I look at a seed and go, how did this become that garden? You can go, how did this garden become that charred mess? And you go, inattention, crowding, thorns, a season without attention to it. And see, I think about this, verse 20. This is where I love this, the miracle grows soil. This is where I want to end it up, and we really get the great stuff here. Souls can grow miracles. They can grow miraculously. Those are the ones who've sown on good ground. They hear the word, accept it, bear fruit, some 30, 60, some 100 fold. See, I love it. It's a very simple process, actually. Again, it's miraculous. I can't really figure it out, but it's hear the word, heed the word, bear fruit. Hear the word, heed the word, bear fruit. I mean, okay. Uh, let the Son of God shine his light in your life, and what do you know? Sun, good sun, good seed, good soil. Who would have ever thought about this? And again, it's not always the kind of thing that you're talking about where someone says it's got to be this big. I love the fact that it says 30-fold, 60, and 100, right? He, he doesn't say it's got to be 100 or it's not impressive. He's like, you know, 30, 60, 100. He tells this story in another gospel, in another context, and he actually takes it the other way. I like that about Jesus. He says, next time he goes, you know, it's like 100, 60, 
30? I mean, I, it's like, how low can you go? I mean, uh, an orange is better than nothing, right? Aren't you glad it's there? Um, and, and, and you think about that, and you say, I can have a hard soil, right? But I can, any fruit is better than no fruit, right? And, and things can bounce off my brain. Things can, you know, get crowded out in my life. But, you know, it's an amazing thing when I look and I go, I don't know. I don't think I did this. I know I didn't do this. I mean, how did this happen? And if we were stuck with a type of soil, a soul, through our whole life, what would be the point of the parable? Again, I come back to that. So this is the choice part of this thought. And that's where I ended up with you today. Use it or lose it. You know, he, he basically says, if you got ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, the weird thing about it is the more you hear, the easier it, get, it gets to hear. Um, the less you hear, the easier it is to not hear. Um, that's why he says in verse 21 through 23, the lamp. He gives another parable. He said, would you hide a lamp? Would you, uh, you know, have a greenhouse and have a light and just put it under a lamp? What's the point of that? The light isn't getting out. You either use it or you lose it. It's going to go out. If you put an oil lamp under a bushel, guess what? The oxygen will choke it out and you won't even have a light. So he says, let it, use it or lose it with a, with a seed. You know, put it in there. Oh, no, I'm saving them. What are you saving them for? Do you realize the, the flowers that come out of this have more seeds in them? I, I, there's no shortage of seeds. And Jesus said to him, take heed what you hear. With the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. Those who hear, more will be given. I love it. Whoever has, more will be given. If you don't have any, you'll even get that taken away. I, have you ever thought about the fact that God's not fair? God is not fair. He's better than fair. <laughs> what is, you know, that's not fair, God. No, it isn't. Um, if, you, if you sow all your seed, God says, I'll give you more. Uh, you run out? Uh, man, I've run out. Use it or lose it. I don't want to lose it. I'll hold on to it. He says, that's the way to lose it. We do this at our house. Um, when the kids, especially were young, they would want, they would compete. We got three kids, right? And you got food there, and they all thought there's a limited amount. So mac and cheese was like the first scoop onto the plate, right? And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. It was like, finish what you have, and you'll get more. There's an there's a endless pan of mac and cheese, right? Bottomless mac and cheese. But you can't take it in the first scoop. You have because then cough on it and lick it and stuff. <laughs> Don't do that. You know what you do is you get your scoop. You finish that. You get more. You finish that. You get more. God's economy is so much like that. Use it or lose it. And so this is where he ends it. And I think about this. This is so cool to me. Verse twenty-six. All right. This is where we end. I promise. He said, "The kingdom of God is as if a man would scatter seed on the ground." Verse twenty-seven. He sleeps by night and rises by day, and the seed sprouts and grow. And notice this: He himself does not know how, for the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the full grain of the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle, and the harvest is come. This is what he's saying. He's saying, I, I mean, you know, of course God understands. You, you know this is just an illustration, but he's not like, I don't know how it happened. <laughs> of course he does. But he's saying it's a mystery. Even farmers, there's farmers who are like, uh, I don't know, you, you, but I can tell you how to grow it. I go to sleep and I wake up and there it is, right? Even, even farmers who are early, early to bed, early to rise, do go to sleep and it's still grows. He himself doesn't know how. I don't know how. The earth yields crop by itself. The harvest happened. That's what I wrote down. Harvest will happen. You want peace in your life? Know this. Harvest will happen. God, I choose a good soul. What a cool choice God gave us. I want a good soul. Okay, we may have to break it up some. All right. May have to rake it. May have to aerate it. You know, but I choose it. I want it. Bring on the good soil. And God says, okay, we're going to have to rip some rocks out. We're going to have to take some crowded stuff out. We're going to, uh, all right, we're doing it. But guess what? Harvest will happen. It will happen. It just happens. Fruit happens. And I love that because when you think about it, if you've got a root, it, you will have fruit. If you have a root, you'll have fruit. It's just that simple. And back in school, the styrofoam cup, remember that one? The styrofoam cup with a little bit of soil and you'd put the seed in and you'd go home for the weekend and boop. Did, was I the only kid who had this experiment? And you'd come back and it'd be like your pumpkin seed or whatever it was was split in half. And, and we were like, how did it happen? I don't know how it happened, but it happened. 
and that's why I say it, it was good soil, yeah. good seed, sun, put it in a window, mm -hmm. styrofoam cup, man, <laughs> it was not that impressive. Yeah. But out of that came growth. And I look at those things and go, well, that's my life. I may be a styrofoam cup full of dirt. And God says, I can do something with that. Harvest will happen with that. So I hope you'll go off with those thoughts to power the potential packed into your life. You have no idea. Don't let it sit on the shelf. Thank you, Lord, for this time. I pray that uh, everyone going their respective ways would go uh, your way, whatever that is. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.